just as so everyone knows, we're going to record these sessions, the session, and uh, we'll be able to share it with you uh, afterwards. And uh, that's pretty well it. Uh, so hopefully everyone enjoys it. And uh, thanks for participating. Uh, pass it off to you, Bruce. Shane, thank you. Welcome, everybody. I, I can tell we have probably maybe one to 2,000 students across the province tuning in to hear from one of Nova Scotia's greatest ever sport legends. A lot of people on the call and on the on the pre-questions are, are a bit confused about softball and baseball. We'll get to that shortly. But I want to introduce you to a guy by the name of Mark Smith. Now, Mark is probably the best softball player ever to play on planet Earth. He was that good in his prime. He right now, at this, at this point in time, is the coach of the Canadian women's Olympic softball team that hopefully will be competing in Tokyo in just a few months' time. I want to show you a, a quick video. Mark was an incredible hitter and even more incredible pitcher when it came to the sport of softball. Sometimes when you play video on Zoom, it can be a little a little wonky and unpredictable, but take a look here. This was Mark a few years back throwing a softball close to 100 miles an hour. Take a look and listen. Very interesting about Mark Smith. He certainly is acknowledged as one of the world's best pitchers. He's also a pitcher who's feared. So there he is from a few years back, Mark Smith, who now lives in the Annapolis Valley in Nova Scotia. He is currently the, the director of sport for Sport Nova Scotia, as I mentioned as well, the coach of the Canadian women's national softball team, a member of the Nova Scotia Sport Hall of Fame. Always great to talk to him, especially so during Black History Month. Let's say hello to Mark. Mark, good morning. Thank you for being on this call. Hi, Bruce, and hello to everybody. I'm happy to be here. Look, uh, right out of the gate, a, a lot of the kids who wrote in pre-questions would love to hear you describe the difference between baseball and softball what are the biggest differences uh the, well i guess there's a few uh, the ball for starters uh, baseball is a nine inch ball softball is a 12 inch ball uh, field dimensions are considerably uh, shorter in softball the base paths are 60 feet in baseball they're 90 feet the pitcher's mound in baseball is 60 feet six inches softball it's 43 feet for women 46 feet for men the outfield fence in baseball can be anywhere from 400 feet down the line to 450 feet in center field. In softball, it's more likely to be 230 feet down the line, maybe 250 feet to center field. So much smaller field dimensions, a larger ball. And when it comes to the actual time it takes to play the game, uh, you would play a softball game, a seven inning softball game, probably in half the time it takes to play a nine inning baseball game. How were you first introduced to the sport of softball? My dad was involved in softball as an umpire for many years and prior to that a player and um, my first memories uh, of the game was following my dad to the commons when he would go up to play and watching him play and then eventually watching him officiate so being around the commons and being around the senior players of the day was really my first introduction to the sport. Now for kids around the province that are hearing the term commons explain what that is and what it was in relation to where you grew up. Well, the Halifax Commons is a large green space in Halifax. There's a North Commons and a South Commons, and both of them are designed for physical activity and sport. And if I go back to my youth, there were primarily ball fields on the Commons, either baseball fields or softball fields. I happen to live one street removed from the Commons on Bower Street, uh, closer to the Halifax Harbor, but you literally went out my front door. We would go through a uh, a parking lot uh, of a business that was across the street and we would be across from the commons. And so I could be home within two minutes, um, you know, of, of uh, things finishing on the commons. It, it essentially sort of became our backyard. It's where we played tackle football. It's where we skated in the wintertime and played shinny. And it's where we played baseball in the summertime. So 
uh, for me, it, it really is like home. And, and it's uh, I, today, it's still a huge green space. In fact, the Oval, the Amera Oval, where the, uh, the Canada night or the 2011 Canada Winter Games hosted long track speed skating was held on the Oval on the Commons. And that's the that's the piece of real estate I'm speaking of. Yeah, you, you would go on to become one of the best pitchers ever to play in softball. What's your earliest memory of, of taking that big ball and whipping it underhand? I had a neighbor who um, used to play, who was a softball pitcher. I, I know of the game, but I was playing baseball at the time. And uh, he was a little bit older than I was. And, and there weren't many people on our street that were old enough or big enough to play catch with him. And so it really, I would go out and play catch with him more because he wanted to pitch than I wanted to pitch. And that was sort of my first real um exposure to softball and he happened to also be left-handed so as I am so I would watch him pitch it underhand and and having watched the senior players you know throw the ball um, both underhand and overhand I was a little bit curious of it but probably my first recollections are being out on the sidewalk simply having a game of catch with Dana and him pitching it underhand to me and me eventually pitching it back underhand to him and and away we went from there. Some of the best athletes mark in, in any sports they have part of their history where there's a chapter that includes playing against men when they were kids. I know Sidney Crosby was 16 mm -hmm. playing against men. Uh, LeBron James, the same. How old were you when you were recruited by a men's team to pitch against men? I, I think probably around 16. Um, I was around the commons a lot when I wasn't playing, I was watching and uh there were varying leagues in the city. There were intermediate leagues that ranged from A to D, and then there were the senior leagues. And so being around the commons, you you got to see a lot of softball, and I got to know a lot of people. And my first memories of that were to be were being asked to play with a team called the Dominion Metal Barons, um, who were in the intermediate D League in Halifax. And I would have been 16. And... Um, you know, whether they had a pitcher that couldn't show up for a game or not, I don't recollect, but that was my first exposure as a, as a young person um, playing against adults. Was softball back in your day, was it a predominantly white sport? It has always been, Bruce, and, and not just in Nova Scotia, but in Canada and certainly around the world, with the exception of Latin American countries such as Mexico, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Venezuela, uh, all of the uh, teams that I played against in North America, I would be hard pressed to count the number of people of color that I would have played against for many, many years on one hand, played against some indigenous people for sure across the country over the years, but still not a great number. But in North America, it was it was predominantly a white game when I played and my observations of the game, both on the men's side and the women's side to this very day is that it's still it still is very much a predominantly white game. I know there were many instances during your career where you encountered racism. What's your, your first memory of hearing something that was just awful to hear? Well, it actually happened in this province, which I'm not, I'm not proud to, to, to admit, but uh, I would have been 16, I think at the time and playing in a tournament in a rural community and uh, playing against a team of older players. And, and our team was having pretty good success. And, and on a personal level, I was having pretty good success against this team. And, um, and the N-word was, was hollered. And of course, I was the only person of color on the field for either team. So it had to be me they were referring to. And it takes you back when you first hear it. It's not as though you don't know the word exists and you haven't heard it in other settings, but it's the first time that I was exposed to it as the only person of color playing a sport and having somebody make an intentional derogatory comment towards me. And for sure, it, it, it shakes you a little bit because you do feel very much on your own. And no one spoke up on either team, not my coaches, not the coach of the opposing team, not the umpire that was officiating the game. So you even feel further isolated when you hear it because now you do very much feel on your own. And I think for me, it, it, it was sort of a bit of a defining moment as, as I look back on it because there's sort of one or two things I think can happen with young people when something like that happens in a sport where you do not have others that look like you to to take comfort with or rely on is that it either drives you from the sport so you decide if this is the environment I don't want to be here or it galvanizes your um, motivation to show that despite the fact that the, the deck is stacked a little bit against you I'm going to prove to you that I'm good enough to do this and that despite that I'm going to show you that I belong here and I think for me without really thinking about it in those terms, 
my resolve became to, to show people that I was a good ball player and that no matter what you said to me, in fact, the more you said to me that was derogatory, the harder I would come at you. And that's sort of the way it worked for me. And it wound up being a positive thing, um, a negative that turned into a positive for me. But still, in those moments, it's not, it's not anything you want to hear or really have to deal with. I know one of your great role models in your career was your dad. And what did he say to you as a kid that allowed you years later to choose option two of the two you just mentioned? How did he set you up for your mental state? I was, uh, I was actually leaving to go to Ontario, which would have been 1978, I believe. And um, uh, the night before I was leaving to go, he couldn't come to the airport the next day because of, of work. And he took me aside and basically wanted me to be aware of the circumstances I was, I was, you know, embarking on that, you know, that I was on my own, that there were likely not to be other people there that looked like me. So I wouldn't have the support of my family and my friends um, readily available. Um, but his, his, his words were that we, you know, to work hard, to keep my head down, to not take things for granted, and to remember that I needed to be twice as good to be considered equal. And um, at the time he said it, it resonates, but of course it's, you're more worried about the homesickness piece and being away from family and how am I gonna deal with this? But when I look back on it and as, it, as I stayed away from home, probably one of the things that got me through those difficult first, I'd say month away from home when every day you, you miss mom, you miss dad, you miss brothers and sisters, you miss the normalcy of, of home was remembering the things that my dad had said and not wanting to let my family down and I felt that to quit and go home would be to have failed and it would be to have disappointed my family. So remembering what dad said about just keeping my head down and putting in the effort and not assuming anything and always trying to put my best foot forward, it, it really was the best advice I could have ever been given. Mark, we've got a, we received a lot of questions from elementary schools and junior high schools across the province. I think a good time to sprinkle one in here. This one comes from grade six students at Porter's Lake Elementary School. This is a good question. I, I don't know the answer to this. Did you face racism from your teammates or just other teams and people? Uh, it is a very good question. Porter's Lake was also the place I think I played my very first softball game. So that's interesting. Um, I, I faced, I, I, I don't know if I would call it racism as much as sort of subtle discrimination. And what I mean by that is, when I left to go to Ontario, the story that I just described about leaving to about leaving home, I remember being in training sessions and, and getting to know some of my teammates, but it seemed as though I could only get to know them to a point. And what I meant by that was that as long as we were at training and doing things together, I very much felt a part of the group. But when training was over and people were deciding to go in different directions, whether it was to a movie or whether it was to a restaurant or whether it was to do things on a social level, that is where I was seldom included. I was sort of left to go back to where I lived and do whatever I was doing, but I wasn't part of their crowd. And, um, and I noticed that right off the bat, but I felt, you know, it, no different than I'm not really a friend of theirs. They don't know me. I don't know them. Maybe that's a normal, a normal thing in that situation. But I did come to find out as the season wore on and as I did develop some friendships with players that some of them had actually been told by their parents not to bring me home, that it was fine to play ball with me and what happened on the ball field happened on the ball field, but don't bring them home with you. And so that's where you then realize that this racism thing is a much bigger animal than perhaps you, you understood it to be. Another question that uh, certainly fits into what you just said. Do you think that there is more or less racism now? That's part A. And how can we make it better is part B. That's from Mrs. Martin's class. Okay. You know, it's difficult to say whether there's more now. I think that in the last 10 months with what happened in the United States uh, with George Floyd in, in April of last year and the general awareness that the world has come to around recognizing racism and certainly a movement to, to eliminate it or certainly to minimize it, I think there's a, a spotlight that's been placed on things that is long overdue, but I'm not sure at the end of the day if it um, has done anything more than just raise the awareness of just what a racist world we live in um, and how much there is to be done. I think prior to President Trump coming into office in the United States, I think the difference between the way the world was then and the way the world is four years later is that President Trump made racism fashionable. 
he made it okay to hate your neighbor. He made it okay to discriminate against people that didn't look like you. And when the leader of your country behaves in that way, it emboldens other people to believe that if I carry those beliefs, well, now it's okay for me to say those things. So I think we lived in a world where our most immediate neighbor, which is the United States, we really got to see the ugly side of racism in society. And of course that makes its way to our country and exists in our country. What we need to do to make it better, I think is just, it's an awareness piece. And I think young people today have a much better perspective on accepting difference than certainly my generation and my parents' generation. Um, I have a daughter that's 26 years of age and, and to listen to her talk about friends that she has and, and the different things that she's done within her peer group, there's a level of, of accept, acceptance and tolerance within that young, with the young, younger people that really makes me feel positive about the future in terms of um, people being able to accept difference and understand that it's okay not to look like someone else and not be treated any differently. Uh, I think, unfortunately, there's still a lot of hatred in the world and there's a lot of people that will pretend that they don't mind somebody being of color or somebody being female or somebody being indigenous, but in fact still do. But I think all we can do on an individual basis is put our best foot forward and, and as best we can model the behavior that we would expect of other people and hope that over time that that makes a difference. Do you have um, do you have an idol growing up, a, a sport idol that you learned something from or took something from? You know, I had a couple outside of my father who was my hero and, and is to this day. But if I look beyond my family, I think Jackie Robinson was one of the first people that I identified with in terms of being a man who was placed in a very difficult situation to represent an entire race in a professional sport and learn, coming to learn the types of things he had to deal with and persevere through and yet still show up and perform well enough that he would be accepted was it made him an exceptional human being. Um, Muhammad Ali was somebody else that I very much admired, um, certainly a, a very uh, colorful individual, but the stand he took against the war in Vietnam, um, I think was something that in the height of an athlete's career, at a time when he was in the position to take full advantage of his gifts as a, as a boxer, he lost those years because he stood on principle. And then people like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, you know, in their own way, they stood for the change that needed to happen. But from a sport perspective, I would say Jackie Robinson and Muhammad Ali were the two people that I most uh, identified with. And then in later years, um, Nelson Mandela. You know, a, a lot of kids on the call today are curious, how fast at your very best could you throw a softball? Well, I'm told that I was clocked at 104 miles an hour at a tournament in Bakersfield, California. I didn't actually see the radar gun to see that, but there was a, a state trooper who happened to be in the ballpark who was a ball player who was behind home plate and, and had the gun out. And, and uh, I guess a couple of pitches I threw, uh, you know, broke 103, 104 miles an hour. So that's what I'm told, but I've never actually witnessed that myself. Let's, let's break that down because in baseball, a 100 mile an hour fastball comes at the hitter from about 60 feet, six inches, right? Mm -hmm. A little closer once the pitcher strides yeah. in. You're throwing that softball just as fast, if not faster, from 43 feet. How does the hitter have any chance to react when you're throwing with that type of velocity? Well, you know, you'd like to say they don't have any chance, but there were a lot of great hitters and certainly people that got hits off of me. So there were people who were able to do that. And, and it, you know, I think about, you know, three, the last three weeks I'd been in Ontario running a camp with our Olympic team and, and um, working on hitting skills. And we have pitching machines and they're from certain distances and they throw certain velocities. And it's really amazing to watch now as a coach how quickly these young women make the adjustment to a ball being thrown from 34 feet at 70 miles an hour, which probably equates to almost 80 miles an hour, you know, within four or five swings, they've made an adjustment that they're able to get the barrel of the bat square to the ball and hit it solidly. So, you know, back in those days without the technology that exists today, there were clearly athletes who were capable of doing it. I mean, no bit different than if we go back to the early days of, uh, when they started to record the velocities of slap shots. I mean, here was Al McGinnis from Port Hood, Nova Scotia, who could shoot a puck over 100 miles an hour with a wooden hockey stick. And prior to that, not very many people could or did. So clearly there were great athletes that could do those things. And, and in my day, there were certainly some hitters that didn't seem to mind the velocity. There's a, a question from Mrs. Pete's class at Rocky Lake Elementary that I know you'll love. A curiosity about how team sport and the lessons learned in team sport helps you prepare for life and perhaps even mirrors life. 
Oh, goodness, that's a wonderful question. I'm a big believer in sport and certainly team sport because that's what I've grown up in. And if I think back to the types of things I've taken from, from being part of a team, uh, it's no different than being part of a class. It's no different than being part of a family. You learn cooperation. You learn the importance of doing your part. There are times when you get to be the leader. There are times when you need to be the follower. Um, you learn that not everything in life is going to go the way you want it to go. And how are you going to deal with that? You learn that with disappointment comes the opportunity to do things better and to work harder. You learn to trust in the efforts of other people because it's the sum of the whole group that makes you as strong as you can possibly be. Um, it teaches you how to get along with different types of personalities. No different than in a classroom with 25 or 30 classmates. You've got a team, you've got 15 or 20 uh, teammates and everybody's different. And there are some personalities that you enjoy spending time around. And there are some personalities that you don't enjoy spending time around as much, but they're still part of the team. And you still have to figure out how to get along with those people and accept them for who they are as they need to accept you for who you are. So there are so many elements of being involved in sport that teaches us cooperation and tolerance and self-confidence and the importance of setting goals and the importance of being a good teammate and working hard that really transfer into everything these young people will do the rest of their lives. How many times in, in competition did you represent your country? Gosh, I, 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 I've lost track, Bruce. It started in, 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 uh, in 1979 at the Pan American Games. And, um, you know, quite literally, I've been a part of national teams for the last 28 years, both as a coach and a player. So, uh, yeah, I couldn't tell you, to be honest. Here's, here's another one that I kind of know you don't know the answer to, but it's a good thing that you don't know. How many no hitters did you throw in your softball career? Um, I would say over 50. Uh, again, I mean, I've kept some of the balls from the most memorable ones, like the games where I had, you know, a large number of strikeouts or a, a perfect game, which is actually where no hitter gets on base over the seven innings. You know, I've kept the, the, the balls that are the mementos of games that were in my mind sort of over and above the achievement itself. But I would say, you know, over the course of my career, to suggest that 50, I'd thrown 50 no hitters would be, it would be a reasonable guess. What's it like, Mark, standing on a mound and you know you are in total command and you know it's unlikely anybody's going to hit? Some people call that the zone. What do you call it? Well, I, there's a handful of times, certainly in my life as a, as a ball player, as a pitcher, when things are just you know, things are going as well for you as they possibly could. And, and it, it's interesting because I can, I can remember a few of those games, even, even today, where there was just the way I was physically in terms of my conditioning, where I was mentally in terms of my focus and my preparation for that game. Um, I just knew that there were times when my skills today were going to overmatch whoever I was facing today. Now, that wasn't an everyday thing. But there are certainly those moments. And as an athlete, what you hope is that you can conjure up that performance in the biggest of games that matter, because that's where you want to be at your absolute best. But I can think of a handful of times when, for sure, I stood on the mound with the ball in my hand and I just there was just a confidence that particular day where I was certain that they weren't going to hit the ball today. I think kids will find this interesting. You told me once that when you were at your best, you'd often have songs going through your head, music. Can you tell the kids about that? I almost said that a few moments ago. Yeah, it's um, it would be the song as of the day. I mean, I think as you as you grow older, there's a song maybe each summer that that's uh, that there's something to it that's relevant to you that you you remember. And for me, when things were in harmony for me on the ball field, oftentimes there would be this melody to a song that may have been my favorite song at the time that would just continue to play through my mind as I was getting ready to pitch and going back and getting set and getting ready to pitch. And it was almost a bit of a rhythm uh, type of thing where it just kept me in good flow and it kept me, um, you know, in terms of my routines being very consistent. And um, I remember hearing somebody else say that on another sport uh, in a conversation I had not that many years ago where they said that when they performed at their best, they, they were singing a song in their head. And I, I had to smile because 
I often thought I was the only person, <laughs> I was the only person that had ever done something like that. And how strange was that? But to hear another athlete who was fairly successful say the same thing, you know, clearly there's something to it. Mark, a question here from Tompkins Memorial Elementary, grades four and five, kind of leads to the, uh, the idea of the importance of doing other things. Did you play any other sports? Sure did. And that's, I'm glad somebody's raised that because one of the things in my role as the director of sport that I've really saw it seen too much of is young people who play one sport and don't give themselves an opportunity to learn other skills. And the reality is, is that if you only play one sport, there's going to come a day when you're going to get tired of that sport, which is quite natural. And if you don't have skill sets to do other things or other friends to do things with, then sport may become something that you decide at a very young age you're no longer interested in. When I grew up uh, in the summers, we played baseball, eventually softball. In the winter times, we played basketball or hockey. Those were the things that I was involved with. And there were there was a very distinctive end of your season, which is very different than today. You know, softball was usually over by Labor Day weekend and hockey was usually over by the first of the, by the middle of April. And then you get into your summer sport and then softball finished and you get into your winter sport. Today, as we know, there are spring leagues and there are summer leagues and, and you can play your sport of choice probably year round if you choose to. I'm not a believer in that. I think that young people should try different things. They should have different peer groups. They should have a chance to get away from one experience and engaged in another one so that when the next season comes along, you're actually excited to be back with those friends and trying something new. Um, that's just a personal belief. I know there are lots of people out there who believe in finding a sport and being as good at it as you possibly can. But I think the variety of sports allows you that when you do get to that place, whether it's at the end of high school or at the end of university, and you simply want to be physically active as a lifestyle choice, which is really important, the more sports you've played, the greater the likelihood you're going to find the opportunity to go back as an adult and be involved in that sport for the benefits of health. So the greater the opportunity you give yourself now, the greater the likelihood that will happen as you get older. I think, Mark, we have time for probably three or four more questions. A lot of kids are curious about numbers. And you think about famous numbers in Canadian sport history, 99 in Gretzky, 87 in Crosby. I guess if you like the NBA, 23 in LeBron or Michael Jordan. Yeah. Did you have a favorite number? And, and why did you like to have that on the back of your jersey, if indeed you had one? I did. Number seven was my number. And I wore number seven because my dad wore number seven. That was that was the only motivation. And and all of my siblings that played sport, we all wore number seven. It's a good number. Mickey Mantle yeah. wore number seven. Who was That's a, true. Yeah. A fairly good player. What's the, um, you mentioned you were in a lot of big games. What What's the favorite big game you were in in your career? And whether you won it or lost it, what did you love about it? Well, I think there were two, Bruce. I think the first one would be winning the world championship in, in the Philippines in 92 with Jody Henniger, who's a, a North End boy and uh, a guy that uh, that I had a lot of success with on the ball field and as a friend off the ball field. Um, Canada won the first world championship in over 20 years at that world championship. And he and I were the two players that drove in the runs for Canada. And so that sticks out in my mind as an example of two guys from small town Nova Scotia that actually you know, put our country on the map at the international level, that, that tournament. And the other one would be the last game of my career here in St. Croix, Nova Scotia in 1998, when we won the national championships for the one and only time that I had won it. And to do that um, in front of my dad, who was ill at the time and, and who watched me through ball and, and ball is the thing we shared to have him there, to have my wife there, to have uh, friends and the players that I had come up with to, to, to do that on home soil and in front of the people you love the most um, is something that I'll never forget. Let's finish up with one fun one and then one serious one. Here's the fun one from 60 Malcolm Monroe Middle School. This one cracked me up. Uh, a student athlete in our class says their team is permitted to have sunflower seeds to chew on when they play. Mm -hmm. What was the case when you played softball? What was your favorite on-field snack? That was it. Sunflower seeds. Uh, what's interesting is that there are some places you go now where they won't let you chew sunflower seeds because of the mess they make. So, for example, when we're in Japan, uh, which we have been over the last three or four years playing and training, they won't let you have sunflower seeds in the dugout. And if you have them, you have to hide them and you literally have to have a cup or something you can put the shells in because if they find them on the field, you're in trouble. Um, but sunflower seeds, for sure, they were the easiest thing to eat. And the salt, of course, was good for your system in the heat. So 
They were the, they were the food of choice. Were you a bubble gum chewer at all? A little bit, a little bit. Um, seeds or gum were usually the chew. I was not a tobacco person. I played for a number of years with guys that liked to chew tobacco. I never quite saw the logic in that, let alone the health risk, but uh, a little bit of bubble gum and, and a lot of sunflower seeds. All right, here, here's our last one, Mark, and I think it's one that you can uh, leave in terms of messaging for all the kids. What does, what does Black History Month mean to you and what do you hope it means to everybody on the call today? I think it's a recognition of the fact that there are people of color across this country and in this world that that made accomplishments or made contributions to, you know, a society in general. In my particular case, we're talking about sport, but there are, are many people of color that have made contributions to things around the world that for many years, these things were excluded from our history books. Um, the, the success was not acknowledged, the accomplishments were not acknowledged. And it's an opportunity for people who are not of color or non-people of color to appreciate that whether it's indigenous, whether it's African Canadian, whether it's, you know, from Muslim countries, that there are people out there of color who have contributed to the fabric of the world and the success of society in many different ways. And so what I hope young people take from it is that the world really is a diverse and wonderful place. And if you're fortunate enough to grow up and have the opportunity to travel, you're going to see many interesting things as you travel the world and you're gonna meet many interesting people. And if you can keep an open mind and not prejudge people or situations and go and look at things for what they are and, 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 and engage yourself in opportunities that may push you out of your comfort zone a little bit, but expose you to things that you otherwise would never have seen, you really will come to understand what an incredible world we live in and, and how all of the different people and different colors of the world are part of what makes that the success that it is. And so I think it's nice that there is an opportunity to celebrate the uh, contributions that black people have made to society. Uh, and I hope that people who haven't had those exposures will take the time to, to recognize that and, and become a little bit more aware. Okay, listen, before I throw it back to Shane, I want to Thank you, folks. You've been listening to Mark Smith, one of the greatest athletes in Nova Scotia history. Maybe, and it's always arguable, but it's fun to say, maybe the greatest softball player ever to play, a proud African Nova Scotian from a very proud African Nova Scotian family, the director of sport for Sport Nova Scotia, and you can hopefully watch him and his team, the Canadian National Women's Olympic softball team, this summer in Tokyo. Mark, on behalf of everybody, thank you for the time. Good luck. Great messages. We appreciate it. Thank you, Bruce. And to all the students that are watching, um, certainly from a sport perspective, you know, if you've not given sport an opportunity, I hope you will. It, um, it's, it's something that you literally can do for a lifetime. And the friendships and the experiences um, and the personal and, and health benefits that you get from sport are, are something you can't get from any other thing you do. So hopefully you will engage in physical activity for a lifetime and enjoy the benefits of it. Beautiful. I'll send it back to Shane for the official goodbye, Mark. Thanks, and we'll do it again soon. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, no, thanks, Bruce, and thank you so much, Mark. Those are great uh, messages and lots of uh, information on your on your life, and I think it's really valuable for the students.